Hi there, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, no camera this time, just doing my recording, uh, kind of sitting here in the privacy of my home. Uh, figure that this is going to be a pretty light, relatively quick lesson, uh, providing us with another building block to the revolutions that Unit 5 builds to. Uh, so make sure you watch and listen to this, uh, but I'm not going to bother turning on my camera and gesticulate wildly because you're not really going to see me do anything particularly interesting as we go through today's lesson. All right, so it's an important thing to remember that uh, when we talk about the scientific revolution and how it radically shifts the way the world does things. The fact that the scientific revolution took place in Europe is really quite surprising. It's um, not quite as surprising as if, say, the next great world power was Uzbekistan. Apologies to any of you who are Uzbek. Um, but it would still be very surprising to observers of the day, partially because since the fall of Rome, Europe had not been a scientific center or a scientific powerhouse. Um, since our course starts in 1200, uh, Europe up till this point, even as it gained a lot of power by violently conquering the Americas and establishing a trade post empire in Africa and Asia, Europe was still not scientifically up to snuff with the Islamic world or with China, especially China, who had been the most technologically advanced and scientifically advanced civilization basically since civilization became a thing. And so we see these huge advancements coming out of other areas. Europe hadn't really made a lot of contributions since the Roman era. Now, that's not to say that Europe was a complete backwater in the era since the fall of Rome. There were plenty of literate people. There were plenty of important debates, a lot of them theological, admittedly, as well as some breakthroughs agriculturally and technologically. My point, though, is a lot of those were borrowed from elsewhere. There hadn't been a whole lot of innovation in Europe uh, since really the fall of the Roman Empire. A lot of it was more of a borrow and modify rather than develop on your own. So the fact that the scientific revolution is going to be a European phenomenon is really quite interesting in terms of bucking trends of history. Okay, so we got to figure out why. Well, first of all, by the 1200s, um, even before the Reformation, which we looked at last time, and I did warn you that a lot of these things are going to overlap, so don't freak out. Uh, by the 1200s, Europe had a legal system that gave a little bit of independence uh, for the church, for different economic guilds, for universities. And here's a critical thing. This second bullet is the first one that you do need to be aware of. Late medieval, early renaissance, and we'll talk about that renaissance thing in a bit, uh, universities were centered upon studying nature, and the church more or less left those alone. Uh, these universities were beginning to pop up throughout Europe. You can see a sampling of some of the earlier ones here. Um, the first universities began to be founded uh, in the, I believe, the oldest ones from the 800s, but it really started to pick up steam uh, in the 1000s and 1100s. And universities began to separate uh, from simply studying theology, that is, uh, for lack of better phraseology and apologies to any theology majors listening to this, uh, God stuff. Uh, as well as philosophy and how to live your life, they began to focus not only on that, and there was still a huge religious contingent, but also on how the world as a whole worked. Uh, European universities, especially the ones in Italy, would have had access to uh, Greek and Roman texts, as well as Arab translations and the latest works from uh, Arab scholars in Constantinople slash Istanbul and Alexandria in Egypt. And by the 1600s, and this is another huge piece here, by the 1600s, a 
big swath of Europe's scientific communities uh, were approaching experimentation by objectively reasoning through things. They didn't start an experiment going, well, this is the conclusion we have to reach. And for those of you who know anything about science, you're like, well, duh, McDowell. But remember, prior to the development of this method, you, your experiments were supposed to reach a set conclusion. They were not supposed to uh, just be, well, whatever happens, happens, and that's an observation of science. That's a big break. Um, and as we will see as time goes by, could be a risky break from existing thought. Okay, so if you're wondering, well, hey, that's great. We've established why Europe, but the Islamic world and China were still there, why didn't they experience even greater breakthroughs than Europeans? Well, in the Islamic world, um, especially after the fall of Baghdad and all of the social ripples that were set off by that, science was viewed as something that could lead you to fall away from the faith. That, hey, if you're fixated on all of these new discoveries, you might not be praying enough. You might not be fixated enough on Quranic studies. And religious scholars who gained more and more prominence when people began to ask, how did this happen? How did the Crusaders take chunks of territory from us? How did the Mongols successfully conquer and sack our greatest cities? Um, religious scholars began to gain greater and greater importance by saying, because we had our head in the clouds studying all this other stuff, rather than studying the Quran, which is what matters. Uh, in China, science was very much more of a practical thing, and uh, the focus of education was very heavily focused on civil service exams. You needed to become a worker for the state. If you want to tinker with your scientific stuff, that's great, do it on your own time, but we gotta have you uh, various brainy people working on the civil service exams. Both of those meant that the original great learning centers of world history, really the great learning centers for the past thousand years at this point of world history, were kind of intentionally limiting themselves, which opened the door uh, for Europeans to kind of drop a brick on the accelerator of their own scientific studies. Now, this is a very slippery slope, and I want to address this right here, right now. I do not wish to imply that great science was exclusively limited to Europe. It wasn't. A huge chunk of this stuff was borrowed from existing Islamic and Chinese technologies, or at ver the very least, Islamic and Chinese texts. A lot of really bad, really, really racist theory has been based upon these ideas. So please do not confuse, hey, China and the Islamic world began to focus on their own matters and things they deemed culturally important as saying, yeah, Europe was just better than other people. That's not true, and it's really bad history to try to operate in that. Okay, now some of you may be wondering, and yes, I did recycle this photo because I didn't feel like doing the stereotypical thing and showing you David or the Mona Lisa or the Sistine Chapel. Um, the Renaissance is a term that's been used a lot. Some of you may have even gone to a Renaissance fair, etc., etc., and it's a blanket term that's used to refer to all of the advancements going on in Europe in this period, this large period uh, from the late 1300s to 1600s. And this one, by the way, this slide is one of those McDowell telling you things about history. You don't actually have to write any of this down. Okay, the reason why you will not hear me talk about the Renaissance in this class is because quite frankly, it's an intensely broad term and it falls, so much stuff falls under it and it's so broad in terms of time and in terms of its geographic range and in terms of the topics that it covers that it is not a particularly useful term for this class.
in here we break down the renaissance into the bits uh, of it that we can really focus on and say this is important like navigation which we talked about in the beginning of unit four or science which we're talking about right now now the renaissance does still matter it still produces hugely important uh, art and other various aspects that we're not going to really get to talk about in here architecture especially but i have to give you a zoom in on the constituent parts rather than try to give you a bad overview of the whole if i tried to work navigation and art and architecture and politics and uh, scientific thought all into a single lesson on the renaissance it would border on being useless and that's not what i'm about Okay, so before the scientific revolution, uh, Europeans really began to view the world, or excuse me, they did view the world a lot like the ancient Greeks had. Uh, that is to say, Earth was the center of things, and everything revolved around the Earth. Now, most of you, barring those of you who get your science from fringe internet websites, are like, well, duh, McDowell. But here's the thing. If you stand outside at night the stars seem to move you don't feel the earth move if you're working all day out in the sun the sun seems to move you don't seem to move and that really takes a lot to change and challenge europeans really were just using what they could see and so when people began to challenge that it required a leap of thought that a lot of people weren't willing to make. Uh, Nicholas Copernicus uh, published a book arguing that Earth went around the sun uh, and other astronomers tended to agree with him. Uh, and that was a groundbreaking thing in the 1500s. And it's really where the scientific revolution starts to take off, where we begin to see, oh, hey, our long-standing beliefs, whether they be Aristotle and Ptolemy, these ancient Greeks talking about the sun being the center of things, or the Catholic Church agreeing with all of those things. Um, as scientists begin to discover, hey, wait a minute, that's wrong, it kind of starts to split uh, the scientific community, the religious community, basically Europe. And astronomy really was the kind of heart and soul of the scientific revolution. Galileo Galilei uh, famously produced a improved telescope. He saw Jupiter and its moons. Uh, he saw Saturn and its rings. And it really did change the way humanity began to see themselves in the universe. We kind of began to get an idea of how small we are. Uh, and some of you who are viewing this, and I hope you are, are looking at this picture and going, McDowell, why would you include this picture when we're talking about this? Because if you look at this, and I'm not going to bore you with all the details of this photo, this is my favorite picture of all time, though. If you look at this picture right there in that sunbeam, inside of that sunbeam, inside of where I've drawn a circle is a dot. And that dot is Earth as seen from the edge of our solar system, as taken by the Voyager 1 spacecraft. That picture, to me, gives us an idea of how small we are. Everybody we look at in this class who has the audacity to call themselves the great, every person who puffs themselves up by going, I am the prime minister of this, or the president of this, or the emperor of this, has done so to become temporary master of part of a pixel. And that freaks a lot of people out. We don't like, our brains aren't prepared to understand just how big the universe is. Uh, you don't have to write it down, but our second bullet here features one of my favorite quotes of all time, Blaise Pascal of Triangle fame, for those of you in here who are into math, uh, summarized it very well with the, internal si the eternal silence of infinite space frightens me. Uh, and this leads to a lot of people rejecting the new discoveries, claiming, well, the Earth can't possibly be uh, orbiting the sun. I can see the sun move. I can't feel the Earth move. Uh, and a lot of others said that uh, the evidence was some sort of deceptive plot, a 
uh, conspiracy, if you will, uh, that went against the established teachings of the church, and so they too also rejected it. And the scientific revolution begins to branch out into other fields, other sciences, um, especially of note when my boy, the silver fox, Sir Isaac Newton, formulates the laws of motion, gravity, mechanics. He develops calculus to do so, so please feel free to uh, boo this man, uh, those of you who are in calculus class. Uh, and Newton teaches that the laws of motion that govern small stuff that you can observe, like when you drop a ball or watch something float or any number of things. I'm way oversimplifying Newtonian physics. Please don't send me an angry letter about how wrong I am about all of this. I know. I'm a history teacher. I teach small word subjects for a reason. Uh, they also governed planetary bodies that basically gravity everything subject to gravity. And while I'm aware that Newtonian physics have their problems when put on a quantum space, they're still revolutionary compared to earlier theories of various uh, ways the universe worked. By the time Newton died in 1727, the intellectual class of Europe was absolutely convinced that there were natural laws for everything, motion, thermodynamics, gravity, all that sort of stuff, and that there was not necessarily some sort of supernatural formula for things. And what that does is it produces uh, a lot of knowledge in all sorts of areas. Dissections become more common. A greater uh, piece of learning of how the body worked was developed. Here we have uh, a Dutch scientist dissecting a human arm in front of a group of people who are looking at it the way you or I might watch a sporting event that we're really into. Uh, and the Catholic Church was not just taking all of this disproving of its existing theories lying down. Uh, please remember what I told your class last time, that... This is not the current Catholic Church. Do not go sending angry letters to your Catholic friends about why they executed Galileo. Uh, Galileo was the most famous victim of the Catholic Church's uh, persecution of scientists. Uh, oftentimes, uh, they were forced to recant their views, as Galileo was, and he actually spent the last nine years of his life under house arrest. But, just like Luther... With the printing press and the spread of this knowledge, you can't put the genie back in the bottle. Now, it is important to remember, the church's attacks on science have often been overstated. Uh, back when I was in high school, so not that long ago, we were taught that Copernicus uh, had been in fear of the Catholic Church when he published his book, and so he published it uh, right around the time he died. He didn't. His book was dedicated to the Pope, for crying out loud. Uh, he was encouraged to publish by his local bishops, and none of these early scientists rejected Christianity. Most of them believed that their work confirmed the existence of God rather than denying it. And the church was actually fine with science so long as you didn't question things like social structure and what is true and what is morally correct or incorrect. That sort of thing could still get you lit on fire, but observing, oh hey, the sun is the center of the solar system, that was less likely to get you anything more than a stern talking to, at least by the late 1500s. Uh, here, by the way, preserved in a jar, we have Galileo's middle finger, which I bring up solely because I think it's funny and I wanted to point that out. Um, the scientific revolution's insistence on hypothesis, experimentation, basically what you guys know as the scientific method, is a very critical moment in human progress. Just how the idea of, hey, human beings have the right to choose their own religion, they have the right to their own personal beliefs, was the important part of the Reformation. So too is the belief that there are empirical objective facts to the uh, development of the scientific revolution. 
And because the scientific revolution proves the church wrong about some elements of scientific fact, other people are willing to ask questions about those things I told you the church didn't want to be asked about. Morality and what is and is not the correct way of living. What is and is not the perfect way to live. Is there even a higher power? All of those things are going to be the questions that will be asked starting in the 1600s as we move from the scientific revolution to the Enlightenment. We'll do that next time. Have a great day. Have fun with the PSAT. I'll see you all later. Bye.